The world of Star Wars has repulsor vehicles that can effortlessly hover over any terrain. So in a world like this, why would you ever really see vehicles that operate in contact with the ground? I think a relatively easy argument can be made for the applicability of walkers over vehicles with wheels, skis, or treads. They can walk up, on, and over things that most vehicles simply wouldn't be able to handle. But you'd think that repulsor lift technology would entirely remove the need for specialized vehicles for different kinds of terrain at all. Why wouldn't speeders and repulsor tanks dominate the battlefield completely when we really see the opposite in the Star Wars films? And I think we've been presented a consistent in-universe explanation baked into how battles play out in the George Lucas Star Wars films. The Empire Strikes Back depicts Echo Base protected by an energy shield impervious to bombardment attacks and to starships. But without any sort of exposition, it's accepted as a matter of fact that the Empire's walkers can pass through this shield. And even though the film itself doesn't really clarify what's going on, we see this explored a bit more in Return of the Jedi, where the second Death Star, though in space, is protected by a ground-based shield that is impervious to flying craft and, assumingly, all direct assault, and must be destroyed from the ground before fighters can enter the superstructure, similar to how the Echo Base generator needed to be destroyed before Vader could begin landing his troops. But the exploration didn't stop there, because it would seem like George Lucas actually took advantage of another open ground battle to illustrate this quirk of his world in a more directly visual way, where we can see again a friendly force protected by an energy shield, and instead of taking a character's word for it this time, Lucas opts to show us how effective this shield is in withstanding sustained bombardment. And what's interesting here is the Trade Federation's next move. It's not like they just drive their tanks through the shield. Instead, they deploy battle droids, which with some mild effort can simply walk right through the shield. And it's not like the Trade Federation was just arbitrarily deciding to hold back their tanks and sending their troops ahead for some dramatic gesture, because the moment the shield goes down, the tanks advance, almost as if we're being more explicitly shown what was merely assumed in The Empire Strikes Back, that mechanical machines can pass through a shield while a repulsor lift vehicle cannot. Now, you might be thinking that this was already clearly explained by the Clone Wars TV show that illustrated how a droidica shields could be bypassed by a slow moving object. But that doesn't actually explain these large defensive shields, because why not just advance your tanks very slowly into the shield then? I would assert that a droidica shields operate by their own unique rules, which isn't surprising. Star Wars has a number of different kinds of shields, such as those found on hangar bays, which seem to allow basically anything to pass through uninhibited, or ray shields, which are apparently impervious to everything but proton torpedoes for some reason. Anyway, back on topic, there's something very interesting going on in the next large-scale ground battle that we see after the Phantom Menace. In Attack of the Clones, the Geonosian battlefield is dominated by water walkers, with not a single speeder or repulsor tank in sight. Now, obviously, we do still have aircraft like the Republic gunships, but literally all the explicitly ground attack vehicles are in constant contact with the ground. The most exotic vehicle at the Battle of Geonosis is probably the Hailfire droid, which rolls. But for the most part, the Separatists are using walkers, the Republic is using walkers, and entirely absent are the repulsor lift combat vehicles that the Trade Federation had used a decade earlier. Obviously, these wouldn't disappear from every battlefield as we'd see in the Clone Wars, but also absent are shields, because when all of your opponent's ground forces can merely walk or roll through your defenses, why bother? So this sudden explosion of all sorts of ground-based vehicles doesn't seem like an accident from a world-building perspective, especially since the diversification of ground vehicles would continue into Revenge of the Sith as well. We see another large-scale, shield-focused offensive in the Clone Wars at the Second Battle of Geonosis, and what's really interesting is that the shield here is augmented by deep canyons and steep plateaus and a variety of physical obstacles, some which look specifically designed to deter Republic walkers, because this is really the only way to responsibly use a shield against an opponent using ground contact vehicles. When Echo Base uses a similar shield, they primarily relied on the secret location of the base for protection and don't have access to the same variety of physical defenses. But the shield does deter orbital bombardment and it forces the Empire to use their slowest vehicles, meaning that the shield primarily exists to buy time for the Alliance to mount an evacuation. In all cases, it would seem that at some level, the galaxy kind of learned a lesson at the Battle of Naboo that overwhelming military might 
light could be stopped in its tracks by a certain kind of defensive technology, but also that this technology can relatively easily be bypassed by apparently just ditching the repulsor lifts, and the tactics had to adjust accordingly. So what's really going on here? Ultimately, we're straying into the realm of theory and speculation, but I think it's fair to say that the shield technology in Star Wars seems to deflect a number of varieties of energy, not merely defending against weaponry, but also other energy fields, such as the negative gravity fields projected by repulsor lift vehicles. And I know what I said earlier, but we can also potentially loop in the droidica shields here too, because maybe defensive shields repel all manner of energy over a certain threshold. So small, slow, moving objects are admitted, but the power required to levitate an armored vehicle is just always above that threshold. But maybe something like a flying chair or a probe droid would have less trouble. But if we're extending droidica logic to these larger shields, Anakin's explanation that they absorb only slow or stationary objects doesn't explain why we apparently can't just fly a ship or drive a repulsor lift vehicle very slowly into the shield. Which means that another potential explanation here could be that the shield can somehow tell what is and is not terrain, in which case an object in constant contact with the ground might confuse the shield into thinking that it's terrain, while anything airborne is obviously repelled. But these rules fairly clearly don't apply to ship based deflector shields, which only appear to exclude energy weapons while permitting fighters, even though the deflector shield is too strong and nothing can get to our shield. Anakin here has no problem accidentally exploiting the fact that the Trade Federation has kept their hangar bays open to waltz right through these defensive shields and into the ship. And we can assume that this is exactly why ships in the George Lucas Star Wars world have shields that are tight to the hull and not big bubbles like in something like Star Trek. Because in the Star Wars context, a big bubble would leave a massive space for fighters to operate within your shields. We can assume the droid control ship had these tight shields that the Naboo fighters couldn't get under, but it just had the unfortunate downside of being mostly hollow with enormous open hangars, giving that free roam space within the hull itself. Ground based shields don't admit fighters, so they don't have this problem to quite the same extent and can get away with larger shields though they're still susceptible to exactly the same kind of attack if someone gets inside the shield. At any rate, it seems clear to me that George Lucas had some kind of internal logic to how shields operated in the Star Wars universe, even if there's some debate as to exactly what that logic is. And that's because George Lucas was actually really good at communicating how his world worked without getting lost in the technical details. In that sense, the Battle of Naboo isn't just a thrilling battle sequence, but it's also George Lucas's way of exploring and clarifying ideas he had about how his world functioned without hardly any exposition. 